Okay, our next film is called Frozen Assets, and we take a step way down in quality here. <laughs> this is one of the dumbest comedies I have ever seen. You're going very easy on it, I see. <laughs> so far. Yeah. Let me try. The first lame joke sets up the whole story as Corbin Burnson is sent from the head office to manage a small town bank. But what he doesn't know, it's a sperm bank. Now, isn't that a scream? Here's how his misunderstanding goes in the movie as he meets a customer played by Paul Sand. I'd like you to think of me as an old friend. Don't be shy. My door is open if you need a hand. Two hands. Hey, I'll get down on all fours. That's how eager I am to please. Running the sperm bank is the uptight Shelley Long. She and Bernson feud and fuss in dialogue that's on the level of a failed TV pilot. I don't even understand why they built a place like this in a hick town like Hobart. Because hicks like us also have problems with impotence and sterility and sexual performance we're just like you thrown in for laughs that never materialize is the character of a local millionaire nutcase played by larry miller that's your very ill score tonight score set as he is no thank you uh but i i've never really alone sure but with others you know i uh... A little of his act goes a long way. I knew Frozen Assets was going to be awful from its opening scene in which we see an executive at the head office jabbering on the phone with underwear stretched over his head. I don't think I can adequately describe to you how unpleasant the remaining 95 minutes were or will be for you. It was as depressing an experience as I've ever had going to the movies. That's 23 years of going to the movies professionally, maybe six, 7,000 pictures. Well, Gene, I was going to the movies professionally for two or three years before <laughs> yeah, you were, yeah. and there was nothing I saw during that time <laughs> that even approached this in its abysmal awfulness. This is perhaps uh, the worst comedy ever made. And you know the theory of reincarnation? They may take the ad out. <laughs> they may <laughs> that, take... that makes it sound good. They get the it? second worst comedy ever made. Okay, they won't the, use no, it. Not even the worst comedy ever made, just the worst movie ever made. I don't know. You know the theory of reincarnation where the dues we pay in this lifetime, yes. we may get to collect in another <laughs> lifetime. For having seen this movie, I want months and months and months in a beautiful valley with honey <laughs> and nectar and zephyr-like breezes. I mean, years perhaps would be appropriate. You know, you have simple tastes. I, I could we, And a big this, car. This is a happy, yeah. <laughs> get something valuable. <laughs> zephyr-like breezes. New movie called Cannonball Run 2. Wow. Cannonball Run 2 is every bit the disaster that I thought it was going to be. This film is absolutely the pit. It is a complete mess. A cattle call of tired old stars doing the most embarrassing old vaudeville routines, the kind of joke that would be rejected even on one of those old Dean Martin TV roads. The excuse for the story here is a cross-country road race, but most of what goes on in the picture is just a bunch of familiar old faces sitting around and telling jokes. For example, Burt Reynolds and his buddy Dom DeLuise trade lines with... Shirley MacLaine and Mary Lou Henner, who play actresses dressed up as nuns. Would you mind if we sat? You, 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 you with us? Oh, you want to yeah. join us? Oh, yeah. oh no, 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 oh, don't sure. get up. A, a boy nun, boy nun. Boy nun, boy nun. Hey, Jane, they're going to join us. Yeah. Thank you. I am Sister Veronica. And I'm Sister How Betty. How do you do? I'm J.J. McClure, and uh, do do? this is Victor Prinzi. We're partners. Are you boys married? No. Just partners. Partners? Well, <laughs> sweet. Sister Betty? That's correct, but we're not partners, we're sisters. I'm not real sisters, we're just in the same order together. So, uh, what do you gentlemen do for a living? We race across the country for money. Oh, and we're going to have a race today to the East Coast. Are you racing to Broadway? <laughs> Connecticut. What order did you say you were from? Oh, actually, it's just a, a bunch of girls. A bunch we're, of girls? We're, we're affiliated together in the order of immaculate, immaculate. chastity. Oh, the order of immaculate chastity. The timing in that scene is just awful and so are the jokes. In addition to jokes, Cannonball Run 2 also has plenty of stunt sequences, including this fight with Burt Reynolds and Don DeLuise taking on a carload of Hollywood stereotypes. Hey, hey, you look like an athlete. Well, thank you. I was an athlete. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I was all fine. Well, you could probably handle yourself. Oh, oh, don't do that to me again. This is shot. Beautiful. That's European. It's but of course. absolutely stunning. Yeah. 
Those kinds of stunts do nothing for me. This whole movie did nothing for me except get me angry. This isn't a movie, really. It's Hollywood stars in sort of a home movie. They don't even try here. There's no story. The race, this is fabulous. The race is barely run at all. And that's probably because they didn't want to spend any money growing cross-country mm -hmm. with a film mm -hmm. crew or, you know, get the stars out of their homes for more than one day. So the race <laughs> is run at the end of this picture, unbelievably, in a cartoon sequence. Cannonball Run 2 is a total ripoff, a deceptive film that gives movies a bad name. I agree with you. I think it's one of the most cynical, lackluster, unfunny, uh, deceptive films in terms of the fact that you think that maybe somebody spent a little time writing a script, putting together a plot, working for two hours to make a movie that would at least, mm -hmm. at the very bottom level, give you something to look at for two hours. This movie is as close to zero as you can get. And an example mm -hmm. is Frank Sinatra's little role. Now, I know that you probably noticed this, too. Mm -hmm. Sinatra's entire scene in this movie was shot with the camera straight on Sinatra, and he must have been the only actor for miles around. Then they intercut that with Burt Reynolds talking to him, mm -hmm. uh, other actors talking to him. He couldn't even be bothered to work for a day in the same room with the actors who were in the same scene with him. And I think he's the only actor in this movie who was smart. I agree. I think he knew exactly what he was doing. Stay away from this picture. He did it. Hey, if, the, if one of the stars did it, you do it too. Sinatra phoned it in, and I like it. Here come some movies that aren't so funny, because here's Spot the Wonder Dog leaping into the balcony to help us pick out the week's worst movies, the dogs of the week. Well, my dog certainly isn't a laughing matter. It's Maniac, a disgusting horror show that forced me out of the theater after only 30 minutes. Maniac is a repulsive story of a berserk killer in New York. This is an extremely brutal film that thoroughly grossed me out, and what sent me out of the theater so early was the scene where we see a head hit by a shotgun blast and it explodes in slow motion. That came after a couple of throat slashings and a vicious strangulation. Maniac is making its slimy way into theaters all around the country, so be on the lookout for it and avoid it. You know, sometimes that's a very a valid reaction to just walk out on a film like that, even if you're a movie critic, because as a civilized person, there's no point in sitting there and watching yeah, that kind of there stuff. There was no point at which the film was going to redeem itself after that. It was a real gross-out show. Sounds bad. The next movie is Black Sheep, one of those films that just makes your heart sink, actually, if you love the movies, because you know that people are spending their good money to see it, and that makes you feel bad because they're wasting their time. This is not only one of the worst comedies I've ever seen, but one of the least ambitious. It doesn't even feel like they're trying to make a good movie. The movie stars Chris Farley as a loose cannon who's the younger brother of a gubernatorial candidate, and David Spade is the campaign worker assigned to keep Farley out of trouble. Help! Help, please! Spade is told it will help if he removes Farley to a remote cabin in the boondocks where he can't get into trouble, but Farley can get into trouble anywhere. Instead of thinking of comic situations involving people and dialogue, the movie thinks it would be funny if a big boulder knocks over their cabin. This place is trashed. Check this out. This whole fridge is held up here just by this plug. What's surprising is that the film was directed by Penelope Spheris, who made the brilliant Wayne's World and then somehow lost her way very badly. Her next film was The Beverly Hillbillies, which was bad but not awful. Black Sheep is awful. Uh, I have a confession to make. This is the first movie that I have ever walked out on in a theater mm -hmm. in 26 years. I envy you. I envy you. I cut out after 20, with 20 minutes to go. Uh -huh. I pretended like I had to go to the bathroom so the people, you know, I, and I came back in again uh -huh. so they think I went to the bathroom and then I went out again. <laughs> I was trying to fake out in case people, because we should never do this. Uh -huh. I left It's okay to do it if you say you did it. I did, that's why I have to okay. say it. I did it with Million Dollar Duck in 1969. Yeah. This stunk. Yes. Chris Farley is not funny. No. I knew John Belushi. Mm -hmm. I knew John Candy. He's no John Belushi or John Candy. No. He, he's a bad actor. Yeah, but on opinion. the other hand, he doesn't have a chance with this script, which is totally... I have never seen him be funny with any script. Okay, well, maybe He that's... just runs around, screams, and rolls on the now, ground well, like a movie, fat man. This movie is very, very bad. Terrible.
Robin Williams clowns it up as a medical student who challenges the establishment in Patch Adams, an annoying and clawing critique of the impersonal way doctors treat their patients. The big problem with this film is that after very few minutes, Williams' behavior and sermonizing become so overbearing that anyone would settle for impersonal treatment rather than suffer his routines, which include wearing a makeshift clown nose. In the American Journal of Medicine has found that laughter increases secretion of catecholamines and endorphins, which in turn increases oxygenation of the blood, relaxes the arteries, speeds up the heart, decreases blood pressure, which has a positive effect on all cardiovascular and respiratory ailments, as well as overall increasing the immune system response. The dean of the medical school, played by Bob Gunton, is not amused by William's antics. But that doesn't stop Patch from discussing his theories of treatment with his fellow medical students. In a perfect system, why are patients referred to by their disease, as in that interesting cancer patient, and not by their name? Well, it certainly isn't to be mean. It's to prevent transference. And why is that bad? And the one flunking out is... Listen, can we get back to the tongue, please? What if a doctor becomes emotionally involved with a patient? What is wrong with that? Does a doctor explode? No. He also attempts to romance one of them, played by Monica Potter, who does her best to reject him. Well, maybe I could help you. I read the bio book. You've read the whole book? Oh, yeah. And I'm on to Whitman. You know, you can get a copy of Leaves of Grass at the bookstore if you have a 20% student ID card. I don't want Walt Whitman. Well, he wouldn't want you either. He was a homosexual. But that's not relevant. What's relevant is that he was a medical man. He was a nurse in the Civil War and wrote great poetry. The film's biggest flaw is that if any of us saw a doctor approach us with William's attitude, we consider switching HMOs in a hurry. He's obnoxious, sanctimonious, and so is the film. This is another movie in which Robin Williams plays a character who's going to show us how to be a better human being, or at least as good as he is. That his character is based on a real person doesn't affect me in the least. I'd rather turn my head and cough than see any part of Patch Adams again. Oh, I'm completely in agreement with you there, Gene. <coughs> Uh, let me tell you something. Earlier I said stepmom was too sentimental. Stepmom is hard-boiled compared to this oh, film. Gee. This film is unforgivable. It is, Ooh. the Robin Williams character is so smarmy, so sanctimonious, Good. the word you used. You're absolutely right. If this guy came into my hospital room and started doing a tap right. dance with bedpans on his feet, I would call the cops. I don't want to, I don't, tr when I'm, when my life is in the hands of doctors, I don't want to see the little red clown yeah. nose, even if it does squeak when he... I'd, I'd like to call this film Punch Adams. Oh, it was, it, and you know, earlier this year we liked... What Dreams May Come, also oh, yes. with Robin Williams. Yeah. Now, a lot of people dismiss that as too corny. I not, thought, not, it, I. not I, and not you. The, it was the real thing. It, it was original. It was visionary. Sure. It took him all the way with new, fresh material. This is just a rework working of a Robin Williams formula that I think he should just, frankly, abandon. Maybe he thinks he can win an Oscar this way. He did with uh, Goodwill Hunting, mm -hmm. playing that sort of warm hearted psychiatrist. But back off because uh, this I guy is really young. that is my son Tim Allen discovers he has a son who has been raised in the Amazon in Jungle to Jungle, one of five new films we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert. I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Jungle to Jungle is the Hollywood remake of a French comedy named Little Indian Big City. Now that film, we both agreed, was one of the worst films we'd ever seen. Jungle to Jungle isn't as bad because it doesn't try as hard. It's more mediocre than it is terrible. And its story starring Tim Allen as a Manhattan commodities broker who journeys up the Amazon to ask for a divorce from the wife he hasn't seen in years. She's played by Jo Beth Williams, and she has a very unexpected piece of news for him. You sure he's mine? Positive. He's got your nose, and he thinks he's never wrong. The kid has a pet spider he takes everywhere. The trick is the spider only attacks you if you're shouting loudly. Go to the village. Save yourself. No, no. 
Alan agrees to bring the kid back to New York for a visit, and at the airport, they meet his business partner, played by Martin Short. I asked you, I told you to sell it at 97 and a half, and you can't do it because I didn't say confirm. You're an idiot. Look, for 15 years, Michael, you say sell, I say confirm. Sell, confirm, sell, confirm. You confirm, and I sell. You didn't confirm, so I didn't sell. Look, kid, I've given to the rainforest, okay? Uh -huh. Alan is engaged to Lolita Davidovich, who doesn't think kids are part of the deal she had in mind when she agreed to marry him. Is this your female, Babylon? This is my female. Uh, and as his female, I'd like to invite you to dinner tonight with Fiona Gluckman. She's the fashion editor of Elle magazine, very major. She wants to see the sketches for my wedding trousseau. And if you're available, I'd love for you to join us. Is there anything special you like to eat? Lizard guts. Lizard guts? Yes, but very lean. Jungle to Jungle is lame brain, predictable, and boring, and while the French version was memorably bad, this one is just forgettable. Oh, and I think this is memorably bad, too, and we're, we're splitting okay. hairs here. The picture stinks. Yeah. Well, just take a look at what happens to the talent in this film. Uh, Tim Allen can be funny. Mm -hmm. He's not here. He's gesturing loudly. He's falling into rivers, yeah. okay? Martin Short is a brilliant comedian. Yes, he is. He, his, he looks like he's embarrassed to be on the screen in this picture. It's wasted, completely Lita wasted. Lita Davidovich can be a good actress. Oh, yes. A, a cartoon yeah. in this film. The little boy, sorry to pick on a little no kid charisma. actor. Nothing. There isn't a single element in this film that works, not one. So you think it's even worse than I think it is? Oh, yes. Worse. And I think it's real, real bad. Okay, so, next Jade, you ever used Medford's house as a place no. of business? Look, why don't you bring that girl on the tape in here? She'll tell you I'm not this person she's talking about. The girl on the tape is dead. Linda Fiorentino is a psychologist with a checkered secret life, and David Caruso plays her former boyfriend and assistant DA investigating the murder of a wealthy man in Jade, William Friedkin's film that is so convoluted in its story that you end up giving up following it and are merely left feeling voyeuristic as you endure the kinky sex scenes. Here's Fiorentino getting the news about the millionaire's murder. Oh my God, I just saw him today. You did? Yes, we were talking about acquiring the new Matisse for the museum. What happened? We met at his house. Fiorentino's husband is a well-connected lawyer played by Chaz Palminteri, but we have no interest in his character other than as a murder suspect as he tries to bribe Caruso. Why don't you come downtown? As a partner. Eventually. What for? Money. Real money. Yeah, I'm having too much fun doing what I'm doing. Uh, there's only three fun things in life, Paisan. Money, sex, and power. Another suspect in Jay, no less than the governor of California, Richard Crenna, who is about to see some incriminating photographs of himself in a sex act with a call girl. Actually, I was hoping to see you alone. Oh, I don't have any secrets from Bill. He not only knows where all the bodies are buried, he buries all of them himself. Ultimately, Fiorentino herself becomes a suspect because of her sexual proclivities. Her former lover is shocked. Just shocked. How many were there? A lot. I don't know. I lost track. How could you let them do this to you? They didn't do anything to me, David. It was my choice. I liked it. I was in control. Jade is pretty much claptrap in luxurious surroundings. The only character we could possibly care about is Fiorentino's, but she is lost in the story's many twists and turns, and her sex scenes are merely inserted as turn-ons, not as any part of any serious psychological examination of personality type. Jade doesn't care that much about her. Jade is about obnoxious, rich people treating each other with contempt. At the end, I didn't care who done it or whether David Caruso ever found out who did. Uh, I didn't either, but I did want to know, and the first time I saw the movie, I didn't understand how it turned out. Now, they re-edited the last reel, yeah. and I saw the entire movie again yeah. yesterday. Now, I think I could pass a test on it, but on the other hand, it turns out that there are two solutions to two different threads of crime in the movie, and the solution to one of them makes the same mistake that another screenplay by the same writer Joe Esterhouse made in Jagged Edge. If you remember that movie, there's a guy dead on the floor, and the camera shows him, and everybody says, oh, that's who it is, but then they all say, but who was it? And in this movie, the same thing. You really have to look and think to see who that dead body is, and then you have to think real hard to figure out right. how it connects with anything, and then it doesn't connect with the main murder. But, Roger, you're talking about it as a mystery. At any point, did it's you not, care no, who no, anybody no, cared? No, no, because it's, isn't... All, it's all the elements. It's all the elements, but they're not assembled in terms of any kind of story or character development that invalidate. Linda Fiorentino is a good actor. She can play a psychologically deep character. Has she been given one here? No. This movie is just showing the back of 
her all body and sexy. All kinds of problems. For example, when it turns out who committed the main murder, how did that person get the other person to go along with it? That's an interesting question. How come Caruso never knew anything about Fiorentino's uh, sexual yeah. uh, problems when every other man in San Francisco... If you could answer yeah. every question, you still would have a worthless story. Why do you want to be a cop? Look at this guy. Bad back, bad marriage, bad attitude. So does that sound like any kind of life for anybody? But if you were a cop, people don't sass you. Burt Reynolds gets saddled with an eight-year-old kid as a partner in Cop and a Half. One of five new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Cisco and Ebert, along with Danny DeVito's latest film, and also the new film by this year's Oscar tribute recipient, Federico Fellini. I'm Gene Sisko of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Our first movie is Cop and a Half, and it's an entertaining example of the kind of movie formula I call the ones a movie. For example, one's a cop and one's a robber, or in this case, one's a cop and the other is a precocious kid. The kid's name is Devin, and he's played by Norman D. Golden II, and he dreams of nothing else all day long but someday being a police officer. He even studies TV shows to learn how to talk like a cop and when he becomes an important witness to a crime, he won't share the information unless the police agree to make him a cop. There's a shipment of euphoria coming in. Mm-hmm. Where? Don't know. But I got a name. What's the name? I really want to give you this name. Mm -hmm. You put me on duty, it's yours. Burt Reynolds stars as the hard-boiled cop who gets the assignment of babysitting little Devin and finds out he has his hands full. At this very moment, the pink, delicate tissues of my still-forming lungs may be shriveling into green chunks of mucus, struggling for their last gasp of poison brown air. The pint-sized cop's first yes, bus well, he nabs his school principal for doing 37 in a 35-mile-per-hour zone. What's going on here? What are you... I'm your worst nightmare. An eight-year-old with a badge. I'm in a hurry, butler. And I got a nightmare for you. In my office. You know where that is. Don't sass me, Mr. Fleming. Cop and a Half is not any kind of a masterpiece, but on the other hand, it's not dumb and it's not boring either. And a lot of the credit for that goes to little Norman D. Golden II, who is a natural actor, very bright and very funny. But credit must also be paid to big Burt Reynolds, who takes what might have looked like a thankless role and plays it just right here, finding the balance between toughness and humor. This movie has the kind of chemistry between the growing up world and a smart kid that I look for and missed in Home Alone 2. It's amusing, it moves, and somewhat to my surprise, I liked it. Wow, we where's your big red suit and beard, Santa? You just gave them a gift. I you didn't like this movie? No, you I didn't, didn't like little Norman no, Golden? No, I didn't think you he was didn't a like Norman Golden? No, I didn't think he was a particularly charismatic actor or a very good actor, and I think yeah. Burt Reynolds is even worse. And I and I think that I was really surprised because I didn't feel that there was any chemistry between the two. Hmm. I thought Reynolds was sort of hard. The kid was uh, sort of looking. You could see him sometimes looking for his lines. And, uh, gee, I, didn't, I thought it was uh, dumb, not well, credible whatsoever. Reynolds plays the cop like a real cop instead of playing him like some kind of a, oh, I uh, think it's a, cartoon. a marshmallow. I think it's it a is cartoon. a cartoon, Gene. Yeah, it is a, a cartoon. A lame one. And our next movie is not only the first feature in a long time, starring television's top star, Bill Cosby, but it is also one of the worst movies of the year. In fact, I think I could just take my little uh, mental editor and take out the words one of and just call it the worst movie of the year because it's really such a cynical exercise and don't take even my word for it Bill Cosby himself has gone on talk shows to denounce this film the movie stars Cosby as a former CIA agent who is now a millionaire San Francisco restaurant owner when he's called out of retirement to battle an evil villainous's plot to conquer the world by attacking her enemies with trained small creatures like frogs squirrels and rainbow trout <laughs> Cosby knows he's in trouble when hitmen <laughs> attack him in the kitchen of his restaurant. Go easy, Monroe. Yeah, that's right. You can really turn your head and see where a bullet is ricocheting. Later, Cosby goes into battle as kind of a one-man fighting machine.
big door. And no matter what he fires at it, the door doesn't go down. How funny. The door is still there. How hilarious. How highly, highly humorous. Maybe at some point there was an original inspiration for a good comedy here. I don't know. They certainly were not reluctant to spend a lot of money looking ridiculous in this movie, and sometimes that works, but not this time. The whole movie is a mess, and even though Cosby has disowned, has disowned it, he cannot escape all the blame. I don't think so. In one scene, his 20-year-old daughter brings home a 66-year-old man that she wants to marry. Cosby is appalled. This guy is robbing the cradle. What does he do? He calls for a sandwich and a Coke. And then he holds the Coke bottle prominently next to his face for the rest of the scene. First it says Coca-Cola, then the next shot it says Coke, in case you missed the point. Who released this movie? Columbia. Who owns Columbia? Coca-Cola. What is Coca-Cola doing with this movie? They have a lot of products in this movie, Gene, that you can get a tie-in where you can get the product in connection with buying a ticket for the movie. I think that that is an all-time low. Bill Cosby, the richest man in show business, $67.5 million income last year, reduced to holding a Coca-Cola bottle next to his face in order to get a picture made at Columbia. He ought to be ashamed of himself. Boy, you're upset. And you know I am, too. <laughs> no, it, I am, too, because this man can be funny. Yes. All right, you, you said he's prostituted himself. I say he's... I say the fact is he's disappointed his yes. legion to yes, the fans. Is. There will be tons of people who will go to this mm -hmm. movie. Mm -hmm. You know, if they've seen him in Uptown Saturday Night or Let's Do It Again with Sidney Poitier mm -hmm. years ago, he was funny. Mm -hmm. Boy, if they go, well, they feel ripped off. It'll be like, you know, getting uh, some of his Jello products that he sells and finding out that there's nothing in the box. Co there's nothing in the can here. That's right. Cosby owes it to himself. Everybody knows that when you do a weekly television series, you only have a little bit of time every year to make a movie. Right. You can make about, it's like Tom Selleck's got the same problem. You can make about one movie a year. But the plus is you got nine months to have you and your agents look for the right script. If this is the script they found, they ought to start doing a movie every other year. <laughs> Or Larry Leap. This may be hard to believe, but I think our next film, Stroker Ace, is quite simply the worst movie of the year so far. <laughs> it's worse than Porky. You figured that out. <laughs> worse than Porky's too. Burt Reynolds, who seems to have given up trying to make good movies, stars as Stroker Ace. That's his nickname, a race car driver from Texas who foolishly signs a contract with a sponsor of his car that requires him to promote a string of fried chicken restaurants. <laughs> the only part of the deal he likes is that Lonnie Anderson is the head of promotion for the restaurant company. Hi, ma'am. This is uh, Lugs Harvey. Miss, um... Pembroke Feeney, Chicken Pit Advertising and PR Director. How do you do? How do you do, Mr. Harvey? Pembroke Feeney. That's a real voice, too. Boy, she sure is pretty. <laughs> mm. uh, Lugs Harvey is my chief mechanic. Oh, well, then you'll be interested in this, too. I was just about to show Stroker our gross volume chart. Now, as you can see, our sales have steadily increased since 1967. At one point, our sales actually matched that of the Colonel's, until a rash of sympathy purchasing broke out following his death. <laughs> well, that's very interesting, Miss... Uh... Feeney. Pembroke. Whatever. And I'm sure you're very good at your job. Oh, thank you. See, I ain't going to do but about two personal appearances this year. And as for commercial, I might do one if it's real classy. And I want that fastest chicken in the South taken off my car. I'm sorry, that's quite impossible. You have a whole schedule of personal appearances. And, of course, it's my job to travel with you to make sure everything is properly arranged. Travel with me? Uh-huh. Excuse me. Well, then, we'll be sharing a room, right? Oh, no, we couldn't do that. Why not? Because we're not married. <laughs> what a little kidder. What's that got to do with it? Well, I couldn't share a room with a man I'm not married to. You could? No. You've never been married? No. Well, that makes you a, uh, what do you call it? A virgin. Well, yes, I am. I mean, sure I am. I'm single. I'll say just nice. Thank you. You would. 
You know, if you were in that hotel room, wouldn't you want to, like, quietly walk out and shut the door? Yeah, see you later, guys. Yeah, th th there are episodes of Hee Haw that are more lively <laughs> and more funny and more sexy than that dribble. In addition to lame brain sex, Stroker Ace also contains, of course, a lot of high-speed car chases. And here's one of the many of those chases with restaurant chain owner Ned Beatty and his chauffeur, Bubba Smith, chasing Reynolds and his mechanic, Jim Neighbors. Reynolds is trying to get himself fired for promoting Beatty's restaurants. See what he's trying to do, Earl? He's trying to lose us. Thinks if he makes me mad, I'll fire him. Yes, sir. I ain't gonna fire him. If we lose him, I'm gonna fire you. Me? I ain't gonna get murdered. He's gonna fire me. He ain't gonna fire you. I know you ain't a race driver, but hang in there, Arnold. I got it. You know, you see water in a Burt Reynolds movie, and you know a car is going in it. A slow motion car crash in the water. We've seen that hundreds of times, and it continues to get more and more boring. I wanted to leave this movie, quite honestly, by the time the opening credits were over. What's wrong with Stroker Ace? You name it. It's not funny. The sex jokes are old. Lonnie Anderson isn't given a chance to act, and Burt Reynolds doesn't even try. The stock car footage has been lifted right from TV. You can see the grainy little lines. The races between Reynolds and the other drivers aren't the least bit realistic or exciting. You can easily see where they're only going 30 or 40 miles per hour. This is amateurish. It reminds me of Cheech and Chong <laughs> kind of comedies where they really trash their audience. Burt Reynolds isn't living up to his own audience. Burt Reynolds makes two kinds of movies, it seems to me. Movies about lifestyles, like Best Friends in the end, and then movies which are just an exercise of his lifestyle. I have the feeling whenever he gets together with Hal Needham, who is the former stunt right. coordinator who has made this movie and the Smokey yeah. movies and Cannonball Run, they just go down to the south and have a picnic, and he gets his old pals around and his current girlfriend, and they do another retread of these dumb car jokes. You sit there and you think, everybody on this movie gave up before they made frame one. Yeah. Um, it's, if, it, if these are his home movies, is what you really course, think, yes. then, you know, show him in his home, not uh, for public idea. consumption. I'll tell you one other thing. Seeing Ned Beatty, a fine actor uh -huh. with Reynolds, I thought of a film they made 10 years ago, Deliverance. Mm -hmm. Boy, have they mm -hmm. come a long way since then. Why does he make uh, a good a long movie? Long way in the wrong direction, yeah. I